Hello there. I'm starting a little bit earlier because my introductions take about 45 minutes. So if I don't start before the session's meant to start, I never get into the presentation, so that's my, my problem. Um, my name is Mike Laverick, and I'm VMware's senior ooh, cloud infrastructure evangelist. Now, I've got a joke about my job title, which I say every VMUG, so apologies to the people who saw me present in uh, Denmark earlier this year, because you're going to hear the same joke again. But, you know, every comedian has his routine and therefore has to reuse the jokes. So there are no junior cloud infrastructure evangelists at BMI I've yet to find. Yeah? Well, there is. Um, there's an unpaid intern position to be my personal junior cloud infrastructure evangelist. Yeah? Main duties involve booking my flights, hotels, filling out my expenses, that kind of thing. Anybody interested in this role, please see me after the break. Yeah. And evangelists, well, yeah, uh, you know, the bigger the American company, the bigger the uh, silly job title. So I often say rhetorically, what is an evangelist? And I say the answer is an evangelist doesn't look in your eyes. He looks just up there. <laughs> and he tells you that everything that VMware does is under heaven. It's under my spell. <laughs> Any minute now, I'll be took like a chicken because I've hypnotized him with my evangelist skills. So you won't remember any of this session, but the, the photographs will be very revealing. Um, my session today is called Eating Microsoft's Dog Food, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Um, it's partly based on some research that I've done on uh, Windows Hyper-V and System Center Virtual Machine Manager, um, and partly uh, based on my personal experiences of using the technology. It might sound a bit weird, to hear a, a VMware cloud infrastructure evangelist talk about Microsoft stuff. But I spend about 50% of my time looking at the other side of the fence, yeah, because I think that's healthy. Uh, not only just for customers, but for VMware generally, to be watching what the competition's doing, but also sort of exposing the kind of marketing that goes on. I have a lot of PowerPoint slides, uh, more than 45 minutes worth. Um, so I don't think I will get through all of my content unless I speak very quickly or unless I look at one of the slides and I take away what, to me, is the key point, the important point to me, leaving the other bullet points something you might read in your own time. Yeah? There's a danger in presentations where I think people feel they have to read every bullet point out to people, like people can't read for themselves. Yeah, so they're only meant to be an aid to memory. One thing I would say about this particular slide is the good. I will endeavor, I will try my best to be uh, nice to Microsoft and give credit where credit is due. So there are some good things in Microsoft virtualization. <gasps> I've said it. <sighs> Wash out my mouth with soap and water. Um, the reason I have to do that is if I just uh, spent the next 45 minutes getting Microsoft on the floor and going like that, it wouldn't be real. Yeah, it would be just a stitch up. Yeah, um, and it wouldn't be fair and balanced. And this is a VMUG, and I have always tried, even when I was an independent before I joined VMware, to show the good and the bad, even in VMware technologies, because none of us are perfect. I'm sorry. I know customers have very high expectations of all the vendors. Why don't you do this? When will you have this feature? None of us are perfect. Yeah, we all release software. And that software has bugs in it. Yeah, I just feel that some of us do a better job of handling that situation than others. I'll say just that. Yeah, so I, I will try to be balanced, but it's extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to look at uh, you know why we're doing this uh, and just sort of go a bit technical about the technologies inside uh, Microsoft and what they're capable of. Helps if you plug in the clicker part of the clicker, doesn't it? Not sure why I'm doing that because I've got a mic here and I can't really move away from the mic. Um, why are we doing this? Well, there's been increased demand from the VMware community, from VMUG leaders, to have content that talks about other vendors and why we are better or not as good or stronger than them. Um, but we're not about to invite Microsoft to our VMUG events, much though they'd love to do that. Yeah. Um, 
And I guess the other kind of agenda here, and this is me speaking rather than VMware, is I think the VMware community has had it easy over the last 10 years. When I got involved in VMware in 2003, there wasn't any competition. If you wanted x86 virtualization, there was really only one company to go to that was doing it for server consolidation, it was VMware. And I think to some degree, because of VMware's technical excellence and market domination over the space, it's become that kind of thing uh, when, when managers say, why, why do we use VMware? We just go, because we do. It's the best. Don't ask me these questions. That's changing. In an increased environment of competition, it will be down to us to explain and justify why we use one technology over another. In other words, what we do for all the other software bits that we have in our environment. Why do we use Cisco over HP Procurve? Why do we use uh, Dell servers over IBM ones? You've made those arguments countless times to the business, but perhaps we've got a little bit, I don't know, uh, soft and out of practice with making that argument. Yeah. Um, I'll give you one example of this. A friend of mine from the London VMUG had to explain to his manager and to his Oracle team why it would be a bad idea to run Oracle DB on Oracle Linux, on Oracle Virtualization, on Oracle Exadata. Yeah. Um, you can put aside all the issues of they own your database, your OS, your virtualization, and your hardware, the lock-in argument. That particular platform doesn't support storage vMotion. And they just moved from one array to another. They worked out without storage vMotion, it would have taken them three to four months to complete the same task. They did in less than two weeks without any downtime. When told this, their Oracle guys went, that's OK, not a problem with us. We'll go with VMware. So sometimes it's a very small thing that you could latch onto and go, if we didn't have VMware, this is what the consequences would be. But I feel as a community, we've perhaps got out of practice of making these. We just do, because it's the best. These are not arguments that are going to wash with your management. Yeah, just saying. So um, if you're interested, I've, I've started my journey. Yeah, every VMware employee is on a journey. Hopefully we'll arrive somewhere someday, but in the meantime, we just look out the window and enjoy the view. A whole series of blog posts about my personal experiences of using the technology. It's done in a documentary style. So as shit happens, I put it into the blog post. And you know, it's a rich and fertile area. Yeah, plenty of shit happens. Um, I just go, yes, bring it on, screen grab, screen grab. I don't make this stuff up, it happens for real. Um, and it's not dissimilar to some of the content that you might see me do with VMware. I made a very uh, important point when I started this journey of looking at Microsoft virtualization. The day after the first post, I wrote a blog post about a failure I'd had with the Virtual Center Linux appliance. The database had filled the disk and Virtual Center had stopped functioning. I used uh, a boot CD and QParted to increase the size of the disk so there was more space for the database so it would work again. And that was a very deliberate point to say that I'm going to do this with Microsoft, but I'm going to do this with VMware as well. None of us are perfect. Yeah. Um, just some are less perfect than others, shall we say. But if you're very interested in following the journey. It's all under a category of Microsoft, and I'm sort of, every sort of new thing I do with Microsoft, I write a blog post about it. I have an edited highlight, which basically says in about 10 bullet points what you need to take away from this. So you needn't go through the agony that I go through writing these blog posts. Yeah, It's sometimes a bit of a soul-destroying process. <laughs> Why have I taken this on? Anyway. So uh, as one illustration of that, one of the catchphrases I've been coining recently is man management jive. This is all the different management layers you get from Microsoft and how they don't intersect with each other. Yeah. Uh, you could make that same case about VMware, certain technologies that don't integrate with each other. Um, but this is meant to be just a virtualization layer at all, you know, not virtual desktops, cloud, and all the other software that we stick on top of our virtualization layer. So believe it or not, in R2, Microsoft has chosen to remove the ability to convert a physical machine 
to a virtual machine. Yeah? The feature isn't there anymore. They took it away. Yeah? Uh, of course, some customers said, hang on, we still have some physical boxes we want to convert. Mr. Microsoft guy, how do I go about doing it? And I kid you not, this is what they say in their blog post. You build a system center service pack one environment, the previous release, do your conversions in this management space, then export the VM that you've created through the P2V process, and then import it into your brand new R2 environment. <laughs> so to do a conversion, you need to run two different flavors of Microsoft virtualization. Please come in, drift in the seats here at the front, Empty seats, you're coming in, seats inside, and seats together. Yes. Seats here. I used to, when I was a student, I worked on a fairground, and one of the catchphrases to get people to come in was empty seats, you're coming in, seats inside, and seats together. <laughs> so uh, that's what I do when people are loitering by the door. So uh, two different management layers to basically convert a VM, a physical machine, to a VM. Yeah. And that's what I mean by management jive. Uh, why did they take that feature away? Is this a viable solution for basically taking a physical box and putting it into a virtual machine? Is this something you want to deal with on a daily basis? I don't think so. Just saying. So um, I think it's up to us to sort of take a little bit of the hype out of Hyper-V. Um, the one that you always hear is uh, Microsoft is cheaper and uh, it's free. Uh, well, have a look at what the cost is of a data center license for R2. Yeah, it's not free. Yeah, albeit from that data center license, you can have unlimited VMs. You still have to buy something from Microsoft, not least support as well. Yeah, um, it's worth mentioning that prices went up this year by 28% on Hyper-V. And earlier this year, prices went up depending on which particular relationship we have, we have with Microsoft's Byzantine licensing system. There are people who are employed at Microsoft who only do licensing. That's because nobody else understands it. Yeah. <laughs> of 10 to 20% increase on the system center side of things. Yeah. So you, you'll get lots of stuff like, uh, you know, uh, unlimited, unlimited V motions, unlimited live migrations. The default is actually two migrations until you make it unlimited. Yeah. Might reveal a bit more about the realities of what that can scale of it. You'll get a lot of, uh, only Microsoft understands Windows, and let's face it, you're a Windows environment, yeah? And so wouldn't Windows be the best way to run Windows, is the argument that they would say. And I think one that's been rolling around since ever I got involved in the VMware community is, will VMware be the next novel? I tell you what, if you want to write a blog post and drive a lot of traffic to your blog, write something like that, yeah? Because <laughs> it's like the parlor game of our era. Will VMware become the next novel? Will Microsoft be the next Lotus? You know, it's, it's almost vacuous to make these distinctions. I think what the reason that people do it is in your IT experience, which may be 10 or 20 years, you've got a particular telescoped view of history. Yeah, This happened in the previous de decade, so surely it must happen again the next. Well, you know, as Mark said, history repeats itself the first time as tragedy, the second time as farce. Yeah. We cannot predict on what the outcome of VMware will be based on the last 15 or 20 years worth of experience. Yeah. So my joke is, well, if, if VMware is the, uh, the next Novell, then Microsoft is the next IBM. A large incumbent IT company, still important to the industry, but a shadow of its former self and not the dominant player. You could make the counter argument if you want to. But to be honest with you, none of this really matters. Yeah, it's just good drinking talk, you know, over beers, you know. Um, the other thing I would draw your attention to is how frequently Microsoft have <coughs> poo-pooed a particular technology from VMware only two or three years later to have that same technology. So they did say that vMotion was a toy, yeah, that it had no real production use. And then once they get live migration, well, you know, now it's matured, now that we have it. This is a typical vendor tactic. When you don't have a feature, and you know it's going to take you three or four or five years to get it, what you then do is poo-poo and say that feature isn't important. Then when you do have the feature, rather than saying you've had a road of Damascus conversion, you go, well, you know, 
the technology has moved on and things have matured and we now think it is a good idea. Ooh, handy that, isn't it? Um, the same thing was said about memory over commitment, the ability to assign more memory to a VM than is present on the physical box. This is dangerous thing to do. Yeah. And also a uh, kind of third around transparent page sharing and um, you know, by saying that it's made irrelevant by randomization of pages for security. It isn't actually. There are still massive benefits to TPS even when you've got random page memory. The other thing I want to get across in this session in the early parts is I think terms like single pane of glass, TCO, ROI, those matrices where you get the company names at the top, features at the bottom with little X's all over the place, the Gartner magic quadrants, that's all bullshit. <laughs> right? It's all bullshit. Here's why. All of these terms are so vacuous and empty and have been said by so many people over the last 20 years of my career that they are meaningless. Yeah, meaningless. I only wish my friends in Silicon Valley could appreciate that because there are people who still come out with these terms as if they have some currency. They've been hollowed out of so all of their meaning that they are of no use to us anymore. Yeah. I'll give you an example. At last year's VMworld, one of our own presenters introduced our technologies and said, we guarantee this will deliver a high TCO. To which I went, no! We don't want a high total cost of ownership, we want a low total cost of ownership. Now, you could argue that's a slip of the tongue, and you know, I, when I'm talking to you now, I will say something wrong, because the words are coming out of my mouth just as my brain is processing each one. I literally don't know what the next word is going to be coming out of my mouth. Oh my god, I'm trapped! Ah! Um, but it, I think it might have been also a revelation that that, that word doesn't mean anything anymore. Because you know when people use words in a way that they have no relationship to their original meaning? That's because they don't have any meaning anymore. It's the way our politicians speak. Yeah, in that kind of vacuous, media-ready trained process where anything goes wrong, the politician says, well, this happened many months ago and we have learned our lessons and we've looked very hard and we've put new policies in place. So this will never ever happen again until it does six months later. So the problem with TCO is there's not a software company on the planet that can't demonstrate to you that they have a TCO study that proves that their product has a low TCO. And who could dispute that when our industry doesn't really have many, if any, independent benchmarks as such a thing. You can't measure it. So you can make the claim because nobody can ever dispute it. So what I think we need to do in our industry is have a whole new bunch of concepts and phrases that replaces all of that. And yes, in five or 10 or 20 years time, these will be hollowed out and meaningless as well because marketing people will get hold of them and then they will squeeze all the meaning out of these words until there's nothing left. And then we will need new words to talk about it. It's just the way it is. So I think of that phrase is like, when customers say to me, oh, it's good enough. That's a phrase I hear, oh, it's good enough for our users. No, good enough is never good enough. I've worked in environments where the good enough product was bought, everybody hated it, it caused a lot of frustration, five years later it was removed, and the better product was bought anyway. Yeah? I've even worked in environments where the better product was used illegally because the staff hated so much what the company had chosen as the official standard. Yeah, won't mention any particular names, but I'm sure people here have come across this too. Yeah, yeah this is the officially sanctioned software. It's rubbish. This is what we actually use, but we just don't tell management. Yeah. Um, there are other phrases as well. Uh, things like um, the true cost of ownership. Now, for me, the true cost of ownership is when a vendor sells you a product, but they don't tell you all the things it's missing. And therefore, you end up having to patch up the differences by other software. And the other thing that the uh, true cost of ownership often disguise is the real value to the business of making a change. In my experience, it, it usually is the case that for a company to change from one technology to another, they must either really, really hate them, or where they're going to, can offer them 10x increases in performance, or 10x increases or uh, decreases in cost, or both. This is why VMware was so successful. Yeah? 
because service consolidation, forgive the phrase, was a kind of no-brainer in terms of cost savings. Yeah. But I think these, maybe somebody here can bring up uh, new concepts and new words, but the whole language of how we talk about technologies, I think, is it needs changing. Um, you'll also find a lot of kind of me too architecture going on where every vendor tries to match what the other vendor has, saying we've got that too. Yeah, this is the typical kind of putting an X in the column next to a feature. I, I've got this idea for a blog post which is called Beyond the Matrix. Beyond those boxes that have the list of the vendors and the list of the features and the X's in. I think those X's should be replaced with little pint glasses. And for VMware, the pint glass is very full, but for some of its competitors, the pint glass is half full, <laughs> or it's the dregs at the bottom of the glass. The trouble with the X, beyond the X, beyond the matrix, is it doesn't tell you how good that technology is. It just tells you, tick, we've got it too, Mr. CIO, Mr. CTO, tick, 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 tick. Nobody ever really investigates to say, well, yeah, you've got the feature, but is it any good? Animated slides. So um, the other thing you'll see a lot from Microsoft and other competitors is a lot of announcements, pre-announcing. Pre-announcing the beta of a thing that's yet to be released for another three years. What I would uh, demonstrate or point out to you is like a lot of good ISVs, and there are good ISVs that VMware partners with and competes with, what they actually set about is delivering product, not marketing and the promise of something always to come. It's always a danger that I think, and something I've seen a lot in my own time at VMware. There's such a lot of noise in the industry from marketeers, PR, and social media. Trying to get your voice heard above the crowd is really difficult. And you know what the biggest danger is when that happens? Is you tend to overstate and exaggerate and make claims that can't be substantiated, or promise a golden future that is somewhere down the line. And it's difficult, you wanna be heard, but the louder you shout, the more your claims become detached from the reality of the product. And I think all our vendors are kind of guilty of this. We're kind of victims of the market that's being created around IT. There's such, you must feel it, that just overwhelmed with vendors want to sell you product. Well, how do you differentiate yourself in that space? You, you think of new catchphrases like the software defined data center. And then you watch other people just adopt that term and say, we do that as well. Yeah. So let's talk about what was good about uh, Windows 2012 Hyper-B. In its first release, the scalability numbers went uh, very high. In fact, there was actually a gap between the scalability numbers on Hyper-B compared to vSphere 5.1. I had to update this slide recently for the 5.5 release of vSphere and also update it for the R2 release. So there used to be things like um, the uh, disk size, yeah? So the disk size of uh, a, a virtual disk, two terabyte limits on a VMDK in 5.1. What is it now? 62 point. Minus 52k, <laughs> <laughs> roughly about 64, 62 terabytes, depending which literature you read. So the gap actually is now much more narrower. In fact, the number of uh, virtual processors a host on vSphere 5.5 has actually gone up to 4,000 and something, not 2,000. Yeah. So the, the gap between VMware and Microsoft in terms of these scalability numbers has got narrower because of those two releases. Are any of these numbers really important to you? It's a pissing yes, pissing contest, in case people didn't hear. Uh, <laughs> yeah, probably the virtual disk, because that, that was a barrier for customers who had very large databases and things like it. A lot of these numbers are theoretical. So what can we do with these numbers and stop it being a pissing contest? I think the way to argue the case of these sorts of numbers is if you have application owners who say to you, oh, well, you see... My particular application is a special one. It's a cat, yeah, and it needs a palace of its own called a physical machine and cannot run inside the catering, yeah, along with the other cats. 
in your VMware virtualization. Yeah. Well, we can point to these sort of scalability numbers and say, you know that thing about I've got a special application yeah, that needs special resources? Well, all of these numbers are so loony tuned. The only barrier really now is, is it economic? Is it economic from a, a cost, total cost of ownership perspective to run that workload on physical versus virtual? Yeah. In a way, I think by Microsoft joining the party and getting these numbers up in the air, that competition makes us want to get up to the air. So we can put a little X in the box and say, we can do that too. Yeah? We're just as good as you. Go somewhere else. So it isn't about the scalability anymore. It isn't about performance anymore. It's about the manageability of the environment and how easy that is, rather than who's got the biggest scalability numbers. Yeah. <laughs> So there are some differences, but a lot of these are being got rid of in the 5.5 release, as you can see, you know, the nodes per cluster and things like that. There are some differences. 32 nodes in a cluster is less than Microsoft's 64 nodes in a cluster. Yeah. Um, I think the big question we have to ask ourselves is, is this remotely relevant in my eight-node environment? Well, perhaps not. Yeah. So what was ugly? Um, well, it's still the Windows you love. Yeah. Uh, most customers are still installing the full version of Windows, which means it's got things like Internet Explorer and things like that in it. So uh, just just go on the Microsoft forums and, and Google or search for uh, patch update brought my HA environment and see what that pulls out for you. I think the server core edition of, of Windows is a great thing. You know, taking all the crap, for want of a better word, out of Windows. But sadly, not many customers have really adopted it. Customers still seem to install the full fat version of Windows with all the goo. So your hypervisor is still really an operating system that's been retrofitted with a virtualization layer. Yeah. Let's not get into that debate about whether Windows Hyper-V is a hypervisor. It's so dull, but you know, it, forget about whether it is or isn't. What is its surface area? What is its target area from a kind of vulnerability and patching <laughs> perspective? Put aside the academic debate. Managers won't really give two hoots what a hypervisor is. They don't even know what one is. So why bother talking about it? Yeah. So if you go for the full fat install, you're going to get you know all the vulnerabilities that come with it. And you're going to get things like the VM bus. Yeah. So you do have a situation where network activity goes through what's called the management partition. I wouldn't lead on this in any discussion with a manager, but with your colleagues who are technical, they might respond to this. But this actually would probably bore the pants off any manager, yeah? along with the argument about whether a hypervisor is this, that, and the other. Yeah? It's a bit esoteric. It's interesting to me as a technology person, but it can be a bit of a turn off for management. High availability. There were improvements in uh, Hyperbeam uh, for failover clustering. Yeah, uh, they updated their quorum model, and you now have lots of options for how you uh, have like a witness. Yeah, not just the the old quorum disk of you know one gig or two gig in size, but file shares and things like it. Um, and they've sort of addressed some of the issues around uh, you know what happens if more than one node fails. Yeah. So in the old release of R2 in 2008, it was very easy to have a situation where if more than the majority of the nodes in the cluster fail, it would mean the whole cluster would be invalid, yeah, and the whole thing would stop working. Um, they've got rid of that model in Windows 2012 for a model that's a little bit more robust. So you can have more than half the nodes <coughs> fail but still have a, a quorum. Uh, this term quorum, I don't know whether you really uh, come across it before you were in IT, but when I was at university, the student council could not pass any legislation unless there was a quorum. In other words, there had to be a number of votes of people present at the meeting for something to be passed. And if there wasn't quorum, the meeting just wouldn't, well, people would talk, because that's what students are good at, but nothing would actually get achieved which is the thing that students are good at as well. So, uh, but the idea of the quorum was to prevent one person turning up and say, I, I reckon that uh, we should ad adopt a new policy on the shape of the earth. It's now flat. I'm the only voter. 
I win, therefore the world is flat. It was meant to make sure that truth, like a proper democracy, took place. Um, but you know, it has it has been improved. Yeah. Some animated slides. Whee! Um, but it's worth sort of digging out a little bit about uh, what's you know still there. Um, you've still got a fell of a clustering system that's not just used for hyper views, it's used for lots of things: DHCP, DNS, file shares, Hyper-V replica. The list goes on and on. Uh, I guess one view of that would be well, you've got one clustering system for all your clustering needs, and therefore you don't have to learn multiple different UIs and interfaces. A counter argument is is you've got a jack of all trades uh, failovering system that's being designed not just for virtual machines in mind, but everything under the sun. It does actually expose a little bit of the OS centric nature of, of Windows. Um, there's also a little bit of immaturity around uh, admission control. So when a VM gets powered on, if a host has gone down, all it checks is uh, whether there's enough memory. Of. It doesn't look at the CPU resources for that power element. Yeah. There's some very basic application monitoring where basically, you know that thing in the services applet where you can say if this service fails to start, restart it, try again, try again, try again, as if trying the same thing four times in a row always fixes the problem. Yeah. <laughs> It's like that old joke about how do you fix the Microsoft problem? It's like a car that doesn't start. Let's all get out of the car, back in the car, turn over the engine, maybe it'll work again. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't say that kind of monitoring of services is anything near App HA, which was released in vSphere 5.5, or anywhere near the sort of stuff that Symantec are doing with their application HA, which is actually a little bit more functional than, than, than VMware's. Of course, that's something you have to purchase separately. So you get extra features, but it's not a free a free lunch. Uh, it's only uh, network communications. There's no data store heartbeats in this at all, really. And in R2 of System Center, although there are anti-affinity rules to keep virtual machines apart, Microsoft have always promised that there would be affinity rules to keep VMs together, but they've yet to deliver that. Whereas you've always had in VMware HA affinity and anti-affinity rules as part of the DRS uh, uh, functionality. <laughs> um, one of the things I felt was it wasn't always very clear where I went to do this sort of stuff. I did two posts about uh, setting up Microsoft clustering. One just about the validation tool alone that checks the cluster with hundreds and thousands of settings being checked in Windows through the registry. That's nice. You try and get lots of green ticks with that, you'll be there for the next couple of weeks. You have to kind of accept that you get Lots of yellow warnings that this might not work, but it should be okay. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I think I've probably been spoilt as a VMware guy. I'm used to green ticks. And when I see a yellow tick, I go, what's that? Yeah. Whereas in, I've forgotten what it used to be like when I was a Windows Microsoft instructor, which is people go into an event view and they see lots of red exclamation marks. And what you learn as a Microsoft instructor is say, ah, don't worry about that. <laughs> you do, don't you? Because if you did actually look at the event log and respond to every red exclamation mark, you would never get any work done. So it, it, it's a different kind of mentality. You have to sort of accept yellow exclamation marks or warnings as, oh, that's probably them just saying, be careful, this might be an issue. I don't know whether that makes you feel reassured or whether that makes you think, oh, well, maybe this, this is something I should worry about. Should I not worry about it? Is it crying wolf? Is this not serious? Is it broken? What does it mean? All those anxieties came back to me in the last couple of months. Is it something I've done wrong? Or is this just not working? Oh, it's just not working. All right, it's fine. I thought it was me. <laughs> yeah. But I did find, I tried creating a cluster in System Center, Virtual Machine Manager, new cluster, add hosts. Error, 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 error. No information. So in the end, I ended up deleting that cluster and going to the failover, failover cluster manager because that gives you a lot more information about what's happening. And I could see whether the disks were there and whether they're online. But already I'm bouncing between two different UIs, the failover cluster manager and SCVVM. If everything works first time, SCVVM as a way of creating cluster is dead easy. But I'll ask you this question. In the world of enterprise software, how often does things work first time for you? I mean, when it does work first time, you have that kind of 
No. <laughs> this is just working. No, that can't be right. This is enterprise software. It's nearly always broken before I fix it when I first set it up. So when something works first time, we actually respond in that kind of, no, no, no. It's cached or uh, I'm looking at the wrong server because it's load balanced. No, this can't be just working. No, no, that isn't how our industry works. Yeah. So um, you do go digging around looking for is, is everything okay? You know, across different UI. <laughs> Storage, lots and lots of improvements here. Now, I could dwell on these, but I think I will just pick out one uh, or two that I think <laughs> were significant. First of all, um, Microsoft introduced, in, not in the R2 release, but the R1 release, if I can call it that, the support for 64 terabyte virtual disks, which up until vSphere 5.5 was a gap between what they had an X in the box and we didn't. <gasps> Um, the other thing I would give credit for Microsoft for is SMB3. They have done excellent work with SMB3.0. It's a really good protocol. And independent benchmark studies show it's really, really good. Yeah? Well done, Microsoft. Yeah? I think they've done sterling work on that. And of course, your storage vendors like EMC and NetApp, some of them are already supporting SMB3. Some of them have it on their roadmaps to deliver it within the year. It's a very, very uh, interesting development. It could actually overshadow Microsoft's emphasis on cluster shared volumes as provided by Fiber Channel and iSCSI and be saying to customers, just use shares. Either Windows storage spaces and shares with us or your storage vendor and its support for SMB3. Because it's so much easier to deal with SMB than it is to deal with cluster shared volumes. It's utter pain in the ass dealing with CSVs. Yeah. Whereas N uh, VMFS has always supported more than one host having access rights to a volume. That was something that just wasn't there in 2008. Literally, one VM lived on one clustered volume in a cluster. Can you imagine it? One VM has a LUN of its own. <gasps> yeah. From a management perspective, it was just a non-starter. So being able to have more than one VM live in the same cluster shared volume came in at 2012. Well done. So my joke amongst my team is, um, and I do this just to wind people up in Palo Alto, I say Microsoft is catching up with VMware. They're catching up with us. It just takes them about 10 years to do that. <laughs> yeah? So there's like a 10-year gap. So I was doing more than one VM in a LUN in 2003. Scroll forward 10 years later, Microsoft go, now you can do it with Windows. What is it do? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of anxiety sometimes. But I, I, I try to joke with my colleagues. You say, well, they're catching up. But it takes about 10 years to do that in a lot of cases. So um, I think what's interesting about this enhancement SMB3 is if you speak to Vaughn Stewart, who is here, formerly of NetApp, now at Pew Storage, if you speak to Chad Sackage, who works for EMC, those storage vendors are always beating me up about NFS and support for PNFS, and support for newer versions of the NFS protocol. I can't speak for what our product roadmap is publicly, but it, it strikes me that when Microsoft goes, do, 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 look what we've done with shared uh, resources, what do you think the natural response would be from VMware? Yeah, we've got to show equal kind of support and do something on that front. So I love NFS, but I want it to be on to the next generation of NFS, not if it's NFS version 3 that it's currently supported. So um, some negatives then, if you like. Um, Microsoft have two formats for the virtual disk, VHD, which is 2 terabytes, and VHDX, which is 64 terabytes. To convert them from one to another, you have to power off the virtual machine. It then creates a VDX file, and then it copies the contents of the VHD into the VDX. Yeah. Uh, who knows how long that will take, given the volume of the data and the power of your array or the power of whatever the storage is backing you. Um, it is possible with uh, vSphere 5.5 to increase a virtual disk beyond the two terabyte range without having to do a conversion. It's just a file after all. Remember that. The VM is just a bunch of files. Why should I have to copy anything? to get it into a different format. That's garbage. Admittedly, you do have to power off a virtual machine in VMware to go beyond the two terabyte limit, 
but there is no copy process required to do that. Now, there is a reason why Microsoft does this. It's all centered around MBR and GPT. Yeah. A disk that's formatted less than two terabytes might use MBR. Depends what you selected when you formatted it. Boot disks are always MBR in most Windows environments. And because of the nature of that uh, way of enumerating disks, it can't go beyond the two terabyte limit. Of course, there's nothing stopping you going from 60 gig, 100 gig, one terabyte, two terabytes, but what you end up is with a boundary on that particular disk. So I think the reason why Microsoft does, does this is so you can get around the problem of MBR versus GPT. Yeah, so you could say that's a better solution. Because what you might find with VMware is, is though you can increase the size of the VMDK, the partition table might not be able to address it all. And it isn't just MBR and GPT. What cluster size was selected during that format as well? So even if it's a GPT disk, if it's not being formatted with a large enough cluster size, you may not get your 62 terabytes. All of this kind of intricate snafu situation fucked up as normal, yeah, is on my blog post where I was talking about the new 62 terabyte disk format and the different scenarios you might find. I also looked at some third party tools to convert MBR to GPT without having to do a copy process. Because what we want is no downtime at all. In a way, neither of VMware or Microsoft are doing that. I still have to power off a VM to go beyond the two terabyte limit. That wasn't the case in the beta, by the way. Yeah, in the beta, we could go beyond the two terabytes without the shutdown. So I have a feeling that probably not, not enough QA resources or not enough testing was done on that particular feature. So rather than let something out the door which hasn't been tested rigorously enough, it's actually a support statement that's put in to make sure it can't be done. So it could change. Depends on the nature of the disks. Take your question at the end. Um, the other thing I draw your attention to is there's no storage DRS, storage profiles, storage I.O. controls. Uh, there is a kind of placement technology where basically if you say decide for me where I put the VM, Microsoft will put the VM on the, 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 the volume with the most free space. Yeah. So you know that very large SATA drive that you've got with loads of free space? It'll pick that one over the SAS or SSD that you've got. Yeah, because it's the biggest one. Yeah, because that's the best intelligence to use whenever you're creating a VM. Yeah. <laughs> All right, my joke is, is that this happens in VMware. How many people in this room, when they go next, 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 when they're creating a virtual machine, see a list of data stores and then click that column that says, which is the one with the most free space? And they put it on the one with the most free space. Who, who does that here? One person, two. Now, these people are the honest ones. The rest of you are all liars. <laughs> Joking. Whenever I used to ask as an instructor, does anybody do this really bad thing? Everybody just looks down. And like, no, that's, uh, I've never done that. I fess up. All the stupid stuff that I do and mistakes I make that are my fault, I, I, I tell people I've done. Because I figure if I can make that mistake, so can any of my students, so can anybody who's using the technology. I'm not perfect. Let's not pretend that we are perfect and that software is perfect as well. We're all fallible after all. So the, why is this important? Well, if you're going down the whole cloudy, multi-tenancy, we're all sharing the same infrastructure, how do you actually control, make sure that one tenant doesn't affect the performance of another? By giving them, each tenant, lens of their own that they do not share with anybody else? Is that how you're going to create your I.O. boundary? By creating a brand new silo of storage per tenant? You've got thousands of tenants. Every tenant's going to have a little of its own. That won't scale, will it? You need these storage controls to allow the shared resource to be used, but to make sure that one neighbor doesn't affect the other. I've got five minutes. Right. Um, Microsoft does have the ability to register your storage into System Center Virtual Machine Manager. Um, but the way it does its rapid provisioning is that it will create one VM on one LUN. That's how it does its management. Yeah. So it goes to the array, give me a LUN, and then it puts a VM on it. Next one it does is a new LUN with a VM on it. Um, the classifications of the storage are up to you. So you label your storage gold, uh, silver, and bronze. There's no Vi sort of intelligence that would analyze the array and then pull back 
to the virtualization layer different attributes of that storage to assist in that classification process. Um, in contrast, I think people like EMC, NetApp, and Dell have done a sterling work integrating snap-ins into Virtual Center to make it easy to provision storage. Yeah? If you're not using these, then you should be. The only reason not to use them is because your storage admins won't let you because they don't like the idea of VMware guys provisioning their own storage. That's my job. Yeah? Because what I like to do on a daily basis is create LUNs. <laughs> That's exciting. He's mate next to him is a network guy. What he likes doing is creating VLANs on a daily basis as well. That's fun, isn't it? So uh, uh, the way I try and sell these to uh, storage teams is I say, those VMware guys, they're bastards. Yeah. They're always nagging you for more storage. So why not create a big pool of storage allocated just to the VMware guys and let them get on with their own provisioning and then you can get on with the fun stuff and the interesting stuff and leave those VMware guys. And you might never have to speak to them. You'd be surprised how many storage admins go, I might never have to speak to the VMware guys? Where do I sign up? <laughs> they love us so much. Networking. Um, lots of improvements here in networking. An extensible switch that allows third parties to add to their networking. I must say there were only two vendors who have actually adopted any of the APIs. F5 have been promising for some while to integrate to their switch. And there's a company, I think they're called Iron Networks, who integrate with it. They sell you a physical appliance to work with Microsoft's network extensibility and network virtualization. What did Joe say about the software vendor who sells you a physical appliance? Um, but I won't go on to this particular one too much. What I want to focus on is a little bit on their uh, network virtualization. Now, before the R2 release, Microsoft had this thing called Hyper-V Virtualization Gateway. And you know when Microsoft has a feature, you go, oh, that sounds interesting. And then you start Googling for it and searching with Microsoft, and after about an hour, you still hasn't, you haven't found it yet. You're looking for, like, the download button. And then you start chasing your own tail. You've gone further down the Google results. You find yourself back at the article you wrote an hour ago. Yeah? You read an hour ago. It's like, where is this thing? You know what? It didn't exist as a thing you could buy or use. It was a concept. Basically, a white paper that explained you could have this thing <laughs> called a Hyper-V Virtualization Gateway, but it didn't actually exist. Yeah? The problem that they had is, I thought they could do network virtualization with NGVRE, the, like their equivalent of VXLAN. There was no way of actually taking those packets to the outside world. So you could have all these layers of networks, software-defined network, in your little bubble. But if, if that VM wanted to talk to the outside world or something talked to it, it couldn't. There was no gateway to translate the network virtualization that they had to packets that would be understandable. The, the equivalent in VMware would be the edge gateway in VCNS or the gateway service in VMware NSX, which sort of sits in two worlds, the, the outside physical world, which might have no knowledge of VXLAN or vCloud network infrastructure, and the virtual world, which knows what all these protocols could do. Now, R2 did finally deliver this as something you could download. Um, but it's not a single appliance. What it is is two VMs in a virtual cluster sitting on top a Microsoft Hyper-V cluster. Yeah? So a cluster in a box, if you like, or a cluster within a cluster. Yeah? So two layers of failover clustering to work with to make sure you've got availability to the VMs in the service. Yeah? Um, they both require access to shared storage. The easiest way to do this is with uh, um, SMB3 and a shared location. In fact, the appliance is geared up when you import it to look for it. And if you haven't got it there, it won't import or power on. And it runs as a service within the virtual cluster. Yeah. And it runs Microsoft's routing and remote access service, RAS, to bridge the two networks together. Okay. Uh, I could go on about my agonies with Microsoft RAS. But can I ask people in the room, is, is RAS something you use, routing and remote access service from Microsoft? Is, is this a feature that's well loved within Microsoft? No? What? I thought everybody liked it. 
So, um, but you know, it, it works. We've got it set up in our labs. I've got it set up in my mind. It works, but it's it's not like download, import, point to the network, off you go. It's quite a lot of uh, system center virtual machine manager work to be done on the network switch just to make it function. Yeah, so they have put a gateway in there now. Um, so there's no gateway, there's no NSX uh, support. Yeah, um, it might mean you know third party uh, devices have to be uh, brought in. In contrast, we've got VCNS and also uh, VMware NSX. And we've also got our friend the distributed virtual switch and the virtual switches. You know, a lot of customers still use this primary virtualization technology. And though investment has been put into VCNS and investment has been put into NSX, these technologies aren't going away. Uh, so we're on to this, I think, second generation of the distributed virtual switch. And you can see we've had a version 4 and a 4.1 and a 5 and a 5.1. Heck, I guess there's even a 5.5 .5 version of the distributed switch. I've not had time to look yet. There are some virtual machine improvements, which I've already sort of outlined. Um, key one is in R2, Microsoft has uh, introduced what's called a generation two virtual machine, which has more functionality and attributes than the previous generation. And they've also improved support for Linux, yeah, which has always been a weak spot for Microsoft. You don't say, yeah? <laughs> support for micro, uh, Linux is not so good on Microsoft. How could that be? I wonder why that is, yeah? I would say, though, that the support is quite limited. It's not on the Gen 2 virtual machines you get this increased Linux support for dynamic memory. And it's only particular distributions, SUSE, Linux, and Ubuntu. Um, there's a lot of features which VMware still excels in, in terms of being able to add CPU, add memory, add disks, add NICs. This has slightly improved in the R2 release. You can make adjustments now to dynamic memory even when a VM is powered on, but it's very limited. Yeah? If you do try and adjust the memory on a VM in Hyper-V R2, dynamic memory, you might be faced with one of these dialogue options. Uh, minimum dynamic memory can only be decreased, not increased, and maximum dynamic memory can only be increased and not decreased. Yeah? Now, in fairness, that probably applies to some degree with VMware. Yeah. The ability to take memory away is always a little bit of a dangerous exercise as it is. But I think what we should really focus on is not error boxes, but the differences. Yeah. So Gen 1 virtual machines are now regarded as legacy. That's the old world of the product from a year ago. Yeah. Uh, Gen 2 now boots from SCSI disks. Believe it or not, the previous generation used IDE disks. Can I just put something to bed, though? The fact that Windows Hyper-V VMs Gen 1 boot from IDE does not affect performance. Yeah, I've heard some members of VMware go on about this, but it, it doesn't. It doesn't affect performance at all. It's all virtual at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, it just is a bit messy to have an IDE controller for the boot disk and then a SCSI disk for everything else. It would be simpler if you could just boot from SCSI, like VMware has been doing since 2003 for a virtual machine. Oh, there's another one of those 10 years catching up with it. Then. Oh, must start running quicker. Those VMware, those Microsoft guys are catching up with me. So um, a couple of things to mention. Um, you do need a system center R2 to, to use this. Um, in terms of Gen 2 virtual machines, it's limited to Windows 8 and 2012 only. Uh, it's not supported in Azure at all. Uh, they only support Gen 1 VMs in Azure, not Gen 2. And there's really no migration process provided from Microsoft to my move from Gen 1 to Gen 2. A couple of customers have started to put, put together PowerShell scripts that automate the process of trying to switch a VM from being a Gen 1 or to a Gen 2, but these aren't supported. So it can be done, a conversion from a Gen 1 to a Gen 2 VM, but Microsoft hasn't provided any official support process for doing that. It's just people in the Microsoft community going, hey, I think we could put a script to do that. Which I guess is not unlike our own community back in 2003. You know, enterprising individuals would work out a way of doing something and then script it, and it would gain hold within the community. And then about 18 months later, or a year later, there'd be this new feature from VMware, something that discarded uh, in the community a couple of months ago. You know, not that they ripped off the code, but you can sort of sometimes see that the community is ahead of the vendor. That happens an awful lot in this sort of space. 
So are VMs really unlimited? This is something I know I'm overrunning. Uh, really unlimited. You'll, you'll hear a lot of this from Microsoft. You know, unlimited vMotions, unlimited live migrates, they will say. Uh, and I go, oh, so you can now go faster than the speed of light, can you? Nothing is unlimited in our world. Everything is limited by time, bandwidth, memory, CPU, and we work within those limits. We try to provide an environment which is scalable and reliable and guaranteed. Yeah. This Buzz Lightyear infinity and beyond approach just doesn't really wash with me. Yeah. Um, although Microsoft talk about live migration being unlimited, the default when you enable it is two simultaneous live migrations. So that kind of indicates to me you can increase this number, but at your own risk. The VMware approach is a different philosophy. We, I think the maximum simultaneous vMotions is eight. Yeah. And we guarantee that will work as long as you meet the requirements. Yeah. So if you meet the requirements, we support that. No, it's unlimited, but it's actually too good luck. Is is the I mean I think these are different philosophies, but it's not one I particularly have an awful lot of time for. So size isn't everything. I'll let you pause just to laugh a little bit, I think. Size isn't everything. For me, it's about features, like the hot ad. It's like the fact we support 96 operating systems where Microsoft support 20. Interestingly, there's been a lot of fud about this from Microsoft saying Micro uh, VMware's claim of 96 isn't justified. Look at all these operating systems that are end of life and no longer supported. Okay, well, you know, we, we can't support legacy Microsoft operating systems that have been end of life. But we do provide the facility for you to run those operating systems for legacy apps that still need them. We're not about to support legacy versions of netware because Novell isn't around anymore. That's the kind of point, isn't it? That we sometimes are faced with applications that have exceeded their shelf life, not just from the OS vendor, but from the application vendor as well. The application vendor doesn't exist anymore as a fraction of itself. Yeah. Another one that I'll pick out, if you want to migrate, ooh, somebody gone down. Is that a message to get out of the room? <laughs> You're overrunning. I said I would be on time. Well, I couldn't do it. Another one I'd pick out is how do you get from Windows 2012 Hyper-V to Windows 2012 R2? Yeah. Answer, you build two clusters, one of the previous release, one of R2, and then you do storage migration, essentially, to get your VMs off one cluster shared volume to another. Once the old cluster is empty, you can destroy it, build a brand new cluster of R2, and add that in. So it's, you can't even do a live migrate from 2012 to 2012, from R1 to R2. You need two clusters. Now, let's just think of a couple of those things. The change from Gen 1 to Gen 2. If VMware released a new version of ESX and you updated it, your VMware tools would be out of date and your hardware compatibility would be out of date as well. It would be optional whether you did an upgrade of the virtual hardware. But to do the upgrade of the virtual hardware, you'd shut down the VM, right click upgrade virtual hardware, the thing would whiz by, then you'd power it on, do the next. You could even make that as part of the update of VMware tools as well. So as you update VMware tools, you also upgrade the hardware. We wouldn't say to you, download a PowerShell script from somebody of the community who's managed to work it out, but don't come to us because it's not supported. Yeah. Similarly, I've done a number of upgrades of Virtual Center and my ESX host in place. I know some people like to do it always clean, yeah. but I do it in place because I have some customers who don't have the resources to run two clusters merely for a migration process. I mean, just kind of assume that you've got loads of resources that you can run two versions an old version and a new version at the same time. Is that, is that really helpful for a small to medium sized business? Not really, you know. They've got a three node cluster. I say, well, what we, what we need is another three node cluster to do the migration. Where's those resources going to come from? Do I magic them out of a hat? Yeah. So, you know, I, I upgrade my virtual center, but I rarely upgrade my ESX hosts. Usually I evacuate all the VMs of the ESX hosts, remove the ESX host from the cluster, I do a clean install using something called the ultimate deploy appliance. I put it back in the cluster, I do the next one. Because it's just as easy as me to do that than it is to do, use update manager. I do upgrades and patching between in, within a release, so 5, 5.1, 5.5. When it comes to 
the next big release, I tend to do clean installs, but mainly because I want to see what the install is like. I want to start from scratch as if it, you know, customer never used it before. If you're doing upgrades from System Center, from SP1 to R2, essentially they deinstall System Center, and then they reinstall the R2 release using the same dead space. It's not actually a bad upgrade process. The upgrade of System Center is actually very easy, works quite well. Upgrade of Hyper-V in a clustered environment. So this week's blog post, mine's upgrading from 2012 to the R2 release. And uh, I asked the question in the blog post, what works best, clean install or upgrade? Guess what the answer is. Microsoft does have replication. Um, they've recently improved this to support cascading replication from site A to site B, site C, something that vSphere replication doesn't support. They've also got much quicker cadences of replication, 30 seconds, 5 minutes, uh, five minutes and 15 minutes, whereas vSphere replication only does 15 minutes currently. Whether those uh, shortening times are relevant, I don't know. In my experiences, customers who have enough bandwidth to keep two sites in sync with each other don't use software-based replication, they use array-based replication. Because the kind of latencies that you need to get that working well is the kind of thing that you put into your storage layer in a lot of cases with dark fiber and things like it. But it's a feature we don't have. So there's a cross in the box for Microsoft, but it's not for VMware. Oh, oh they've got an X that we don't have. So um, we do have replication, vSphere replication, but I'd also point out in SRM, we have support for array-based replication. No support from that from Microsoft yet. Um, we have lots of different array vendors in that program, about 30-odd vendors with over 80-odd individual plugins. Yeah, Recovery plans. Um, I've been looking at Azure Hyper, Hyper-V Recovery Manager in the last blog post. It's basically a glorified power on list. That's it. Just powers up your VMs in the right order. Doesn't do anything else. Well, it can call a script, and it can stop the plan and then start it again, but that's it. Yeah. Um, offered as a service through your subscription to the Microsoft Cloud. I think Microsoft's next step with that will be uh, use this as a DR target to recover VMs into. That's what they really want to do. So in conclusion, this is a, a very simple slide that shows you all the relationships between the different components of System Center. Yeah. So you can see it's a very simple architecture diagram that shows all the different components. Uh, I'll be taking questions on this later. <laughs> um, I think critically we have two different approaches to management. Um, one thing I would give Microsoft credit for is that they have actually got it right with R2. Hyper-V came out at the same time that System Center did. Believe it or not, when 2012 first came out, it was a good four months and so many days before you could actually manage Hyper-V with System Center Virtual Machine Manager. So there was a, a big gap. We've got this new virtualization platform, but no way of managing it, was what they were saying. They've adopted, I think, a, a process and a policy which we, VMware, embarked on a couple of years ago, which is yearly releases. Yeah, the days of three years or four years between one release and another are over. Yeah, that software development process is not being adopted by ISVs. It's very rapid, agile development. Yeah, and it means that you have to have what I was told before I joined VMware is a train. At the head of the train is ESX and Virtual Center. And then behind the train, the engine, is all these little carriages like SRM, VCOps, uh, VIEW, vCloud Director, vCloud Automation Center. So within days or weeks of the new version of the platform coming out, all your other management layers that are affected by it come out 60 or 120 days after. Otherwise, you have situations where customers want to do VDI. They're on platform Y, but the VDI is not ready. That's coming in six months' time. Yeah. It's extremely difficult, very difficult to get that right. It is really difficult. At VMware, we struggle getting that right. You know, Can we get all these things sequenced in the right order so we don't have situations where one product is not compatible with another? So if you're going down the Microsoft route, uh, you'll find yourself bouncing around many different UIs. Enjoy. The one thing I notice with this is, which one do you trust? <laughs> when you have three different ways of looking at a cluster, and they all say something different, which is 
telling you the right information. So much do I hate the phrase single pane of glass, because I think it's garbage. There is some care, there is some value or truth in, in that to some degree. So my report on Microsoft is well done. <coughs> Definitely improved, you know, on your previous results. I still think there's too much faith put in technologies from the past, like failover clustering. Yeah. And that's very typical of vendors, I think. You know, you have a, you, you develop some software, maybe in the 90s, which is very popular, and you keep on adding and adding and adding and adding more functionality to it. You keep on whipping that donkey, whipping that horse for everything it's worth because it's a cash cow for you, but also it means it's cheaper to do the innovation. Oh, well, we've got this new service. It needs some availability. Oh, why don't we just put it in the failover clustering piece that we have already? Yeah. When you don't come with all that baggage, you can do things in a much cleaner, simpler way because you're not trying to be all things to all men. I do have additional appendices and resources. These are really there for anybody who uh, wants to have this deck later. That's, but you could create a much shorter version of my deck by using these appendices and take out some of the more detailed ones. Thank you for listening.